So, okay, so I'll be discussing, as, as, well, as you said, the line by line method. So, if you, you're having fun with CCD, PRV, and you think it's really fun, well, try infrared PRV. It's even more fun. So, for all of you that are doing infrared work, so this, this effort is, was basically spurred by infrared observations, Spirou and NIRPS. It, it's not only uh, for that, but uh, I'll get to that. So, measuring 10 minus three pixel motions on your detector is hard enough at optical wavelengths. So you just but then add to that telluric nearly, but not quite fixed, changing in depth of uh, telluric absorption, skylines, thermal background, detector cosmetics that have funny uh, structures, vertical, horizontal. You have stability problems and it's, so yeah, so it will be your PRV measurement, your spectra will be affected by, let's call them bugs, hence the little, uh, creatures there that creeping in your data in your grass or your forest of, of absorption line that you try to measure. And it's the story of little bugs creeping in your data. So it's the method is described in a paper that's uh, here, uh, well, shown here, published about six months ago. All ideas, they don't appear out of the blue. It was spurred by discussion with the Xavier Dumus, Claire Critinier that they worked on similar ideas, but really in the context of filtering stellar activity and basically took this idea to the uh, basically getting rid of artifacts or little bugs in our data. So let's take a case. You have a two meter per second photo noise. You're happy in your grass, but there are three little bugs in your data. Each of them induces a global shift of your spectrum by five meter per second. So it's a two and a half sigma event. Together, they add square root of three, about nine meter per second. They wreck your observation and well, that's it. So you say, no, no, let's be smart. Let's split in 10 segments my domain. It could be orders on your detector. And you say, well, each little bug induces still not five meter per second, it's 50 meter per second. It's because it's affecting a tenth of the domain in the same way and just boost the effect of the bug in that little domain. And each segment has a worsening signal to noise, basically it's, it's about six meter per second accuracy, but you see that the bug, its effect increases as square root of N that you're using. And well, you lose some domain rejecting, dom rejecting little segments, but you don't lose that much. Then you say, well, not 10, let's go to 100 segments and you see, see going on. So your little bugs become 25 sigma event instead of two and a half sigma events. They get easier and easier and you lose less and less. So you say, the bigger n, the better. So you just go for what's the biggest reasonable n value. And so just to make it as easy as we can to flag these little bugs, of course, there won't be just three, there'll be tens. And that's, that's the concept. So the smallest features, we call them lines. It's a very liberal understanding of a line. Okay, It's basically the domain between two consecutive local maxima in Spirou. Uh, as, yeah, and they can be, let's say a line is one line in an order. So if you have a defect on your detector and one line at 1.6 micron and you see it twice, well, it counts as two lines because you could have a defect, your pixel could be problematic or whatever. It's twice that line. So it's a line in a, a line per order, let's say. So we have between 13 and 16,000 useful lines in the Spirou domain, uh, yeah. So what do we do with each line in the, in the mathematical framework? We just say, well, we have a noiseless uh, template that's built with all the observations. Yes, it's not noiseless, but just assume it's noiseless. And we use a framework that was um, introduced, well, more than 20 years ago by Francois Bouchy, where you say, well, your RV signal is basically the derivative, scaling with the derivative of the difference between your nth observation, you're considering the template, and you basically have this, it's a mouse, yeah. Uh, so basically the difference between that spectrum, it's noiseless template, the gradient of that template, so lines have varying quality, so with, with the depth, and basically the sought after motion in wavelength space, that's basically encoding your velocity. So here you have a XKCD version of it, basically your line, your template, a gradient and you're adjusting that gradient to that residual. And here, I hope I'm not the only one seeing a trumpet. Okay, we had a, 
disagreement if there's a trumpet there. That's what we call the trumpet plot. So it's basically for Barnard star. That's, we all love Barnard star, so that's Barnard star. Expressed in a weird way, it's basically a plot of 16,000 lines, each of them with a velocity in its error bars, and color shaded basically lines that are, let's say, the, the best. So, so it's below 200 meter per second for each line. Okay, so the very best lines are about 50 meter per second per line. And well, you have the trumpet plot basically. And it, there are lots of interesting things in that plot. Basically, you see, well, something most of you that have worked in, at infrared wavelengths, you know that H band is better in terms of RV content. You see, well, more lines that are really good quality lines, fewer in Y and J bands. Uh, the CO band head, it's, it's great. It's not mo most instruments don't go there to the CO band head at 2.3 micron. It's extremely good. There's a really dense forest of high quality lines there. We do with Spirou get pretty good past the edge of H band into the H to K gap, which is interesting, adding a little bit of, the, of RV content. Now, how do you turn a trumpet into an RV signal? Okay, so you have 16,000 measurements and it's like, like a movie, you have the good guys and the bad guys and you assume properties for both of them and you say, well, you build a mixture model, that's called a mixture model, where you say, for any line, what's the likelihood of that line being good or being bad? And you weight that line by the likelihood of it being good, basically. So if you see something at three and a half sigma, it's uh, maybe, so it's, let's say, 75% good. If it's at five sigma, then it's one, two percent good. And if it's at two sigma, it becomes basically 99% good. So you have a model of your statistical distribution and you find the mean value of the good ones, let's say. And uh, yeah, if you look at the statistic and you work out, it's, it's basically a soft edge sigma clipping at about four and a half sigma for, for the Spirou data. We adjusted the statistical distributions. And uncorrelated bugs, and I get to correlated bugs after that, cannot have just from the relative weight they have in the distribution and the bug being just at the edge of being basically lost due to, due to, due to the weight, you cannot inject a, a, an effect that's larger than 25 centimeters per second. Uncorrelated, something will So does it work? Well, it works. Here's uh, what's in the paper. Basically we show, we all love uh, uh, Barnard star data and uh, here's in red a CCF time series. So there's been lots of work to get the CCF to work in Spirou with about six meter per second uh, RMS. And with the LBL, we go to about two, a little above two meter per second per point. It's far cleaner, as you see. So we get rid of all sorts of systematics there. We do rule out, was mentioned this morning, the uh, long period planet around uh, Barna, uh, Barnard star. Yeah, we're not the only one mentioning that, but it's, yeah, it's something we see. So we rule out that planet. We are really excited with these uh, NIPS results where we get basically recover a Proxima, this Proxima system. This is the, this dash curve is the um, Espresso Ephemeris. It's not a, a GP fit, it's actual uh, Keplerian fit. And so we're basically below a meter per second at infrared wavelength with NIPS. And we're starting a little collection of these planets that are with the LBL algorithm. So we have the Spirou data and look at the it may not be that exciting for anyone in the optical, but for infrared, we're really excited. We're beating basically setting constraints below the meter per second uh, for, for quite a few planets at infrared wavelengths. Uh, we, there's a paper that a grad student from Montreal worked on revisiting Carmenes data in the optical with the LBL and Charles Cadieu has a poster, see his poster. I don't want to steal the punch, but basically you have espresso data with CCF, with LBL, it does about a factor of two reduction in the, the scatter. But well, it's not perfect. Eh? I, won't be, I would be lying saying that. What happens when you have correlation between lines due to anything that's correlated to your spectrum? Let's say telluric residuals. We worked a lot on tellurics, but yeah, they could be correlated in time, detector defects, stitching, all sorts of things. Well, you have, as I said, 16,000 lines. Correlated things, correlation, lots of points, should ring the bell of PCA decorrelation. So we, there's a grad student um, in Toulouse, Merwan, that looked at this. This is his work. And he looked at one of the more, worst offenders we have in the, the Spirou survey. So DJ 
251. It's one that has really strong RV residuals at some bare values to be understood. And he basically did a, a weighted principal component analysis and decorrelation of the data. So that's a case of a not well-behaved star. And so he has a paper submitted. The WAPT, it's, a, it's an elk, by the way, here's with the Spirou hat. It's a, basically a reconstruction of principal components that basically correlate in the data. And we, there are injection recoveries. It preserves RV signals at the one to 10 meters per second. Here's an example of GJ251, basically before and after the correlation. And there's a really nice peak that shows up and it's, we're not dreaming, it is, is a planet that's, uh, that has been detected by the Kamenes team in 2022. And I'm saying it, Merwan is looking for a postdoc. Just so you know, he does wonderful work in PRV sequences. So, well, now you know, you can, you can send him an email if you want someone to work on, on uh, LBL with you. Um, yeah, and he recovers, of course, as I said, GJ251B, uh, it's, Two sigma discrepant, you can take that as just on the fence of it being a little different with the Kerminesh results, but here it's one of the stars that had been surveyed a lot with Spirou. It has a 0.3 meter per second formal uncertainty on the K value. So it's pretty darn clear and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a signal at the, the three meter per second. So conclusion, the LBL code is on GitHub. It's, uh, you can see a poster by Neil Cook about the softwares. We have implemented for it for Spirou, NIRPS, Harps, Espresso, Harps North, Carmen S Optical. If you want to use it on your instrument, don't reinvent the wheel. You can contact us on a best effort basis, of course, but yeah, it's not that hard if, to include a new instrument. We, we've done it. Uh, exciting things with weighted PCA. We, I haven't had time to mention it, and that's the end, but we have also activity indicators the equivalent of the DLW uh, indicator that we derive also in the same statistical way. That's it, questions. Wonderful, thank you so much for an energetic final presentation of the day. Okay. Uh, questions in the room, Ansgar yeah. over there? Up front, there we go. Okay, and then Xavier after that. Thanks for a great talk. I have a question about the trumpet plot that you showed. Yeah. This is probably coming from, from Spirou data itself, right? So that folds in the sensitivity of Spirou. It, it, it follows the sensitivity of Spirou. Of course, there's embedded in that the, the throughput yeah. of the band. Because, because the, the Y band is supposed to be a lot more information rich than the rest, essentially. So well, that, there's that a, is because Spirou is going down there. Yeah, there's a fall of the throughput, but right. still the, the, the lines get shallower. Uh, the, the, uh, Not well, in the Y band, but yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Tatiana. So in this trumpet plot, if I understand well, what you are doing is that you are looking if all the lines have the same average velocity in so, that sense. And, well, yeah. Okay. And uh, basically then you are sigma clipping those. Uh, but you can also, you could also look at the line, a specific line, how it behaves as a function of time scale. Uh, because, for example, if this line would be affected by telewicks and you have a crossing, then you would be able to spot it that way as well. Do you do this as well or no? But it's, it's Merwan's idea that basically you, if, if one line is misbehaving, let's say, with time, that's one thing. But if you expect, if they say, they say that there's a, a problem with the correction, you, you'll get it probably correlated over many lines. And that's the whole point of that, that, that PCA uh, reconstruction of residuals but we could look and that's actually one of the outputs is per line and we haven't used it so there are lots of things you can do with 16,000 lines at the sigma of a given line or divided by its uh, so it's it's rms versus you expected from noise sigma yeah it, honestly what Merwan did i think it's just the beginning of looking at in the statistical sense of all these lines you have 16,000 values to work with Per, per visit, I mean, of course, you get say 100 visit and 16,000 values, there are lots of things. And it's, we're just scratching. I think what Merwan did is, is great, but it's just the beginning of it. Okay, let's thank Etienne again.